Bike Law Bob here today, and I'm lucky to have with me an expert on what to do when you get in a crash. I'm here with Bruce Hagen. He's Bike Law Georgia. This is the guy you want to hear from. And the thing I want to talk to you about today, and that is what to do when you're in a bike accident. Yeah, and it's a big issue, right? And, and first and foremost, uh, we refer to them as crashes, right? So crashes, wrecks. Uh, what do you do when you get wrecked? And these are the sort of things that people will ask me constantly, and we talk to them about. It's not an accident. It's a collision. Because why? Well, I mean, look, accidents, if a child's sitting at a dinner table and knocks over a glass of milk, that's an accident. When a driver is being careless and not paying good enough attention, not following the rules of the road, and injures somebody on a bike, that's not an accident. That, that's a crash. That's a wreck. That, that's the inevitable byproduct of somebody's carelessness. So you're saying that... If nobody can help it, that's an accident. And we've just used this language since we've been young, but in our world, we don't want that because let's say you get hit by a car and I'm your lawyer and you did everything right and I'm in the court trying to get you just your damages back. Right. And the other side's calling it an accident. The jury's hearing that something happened that no one could help. But the truth is the guy that hit you didn't use his turning signal, and he turned right into you and knocked it down. That was no accident. Whatever they did wasn't an accident, and when the insurance industry and the defense industry wants to portray it as an accident, they're thinking that jurors will forgive them for causing an accident. They won't forgive you for being negligent. They won't forgive you for being careless or reckless. You get hit, what happens? So first and foremost, you have to think personal safety, right? You're on the road you've been hit by a car, there may be other cars around, there may be other cyclists around. So you have to think personal safety. If that means get yourself out of the road so you don't get hit a second time, do that. You know, obviously look, if you can't move, you can't move. But if you can scramble and get yourself out of the road, then do that. If you're in a group ride, obviously it's different than if you're riding by yourself just out on the road. If you're in a group ride, you know, one of your group members hopefully will protect you, let other riders know that someone's down. So what's the next thing that the rider's got to think of? So then you have to think of, all right, what's happening around me? Who's there? Is the driver still there? Is the driver attempting to flee the scene? Do I need to do anything to secure information and, and just make sure that things are preserved when the police get there? So that brings you to call the police, get the police to come. Um, sometimes drivers will have various reasons for not wanting you to bring the police there. And, and I've heard everything under the sun. Um, but it's inevitably to your advantage to have the officers there to get a report done and to get accurate information. These are multiple levels of things that have to happen, but call the police. And if your phone breaks or your phone's not working, get somebody there to call the police. You're protecting yourself uh, at the scene. You're calling the police. The next thing is that you start gathering information is to see, are there people here who saw this? Because just because somebody's there and they're being helpful to you doesn't mean that the police are gonna get their information. And if you don't get their name and number, you may never know how to reach them. Um, I'd love to say that every police report is 100% accurate in terms of recording the way these things happen, but unfortunately, they don't always get things right or complete. You know, the police have a lot going on, and so they don't necessarily get all the information that should be in a police report. So if there's a person there who saw it or says, hey, I saw that guy, he hit you, mm -hmm. get their name, get their number, get their email address, get their mailing address, something so that if you need to follow up with them later to get a statement, there's a way to do that. Take pictures, you know, you can get, we as lawyers, we can gather a lot of information by things like, what was the final resting place of a vehicle? What's the final resting place of a bike? You know, take pictures of these things because once that car is moved, once the bike is moved, it's too late to recreate that. Yeah. So, so, so nowadays, you know, it used to be who had a camera with them, right? Now everybody has a camera and a video camera. So I think it's a good idea um, to do that, to preserve the information with photographs. As far as talking to the driver is concerned, you know, look, it's understandable that you're going to be hot under the collar when somebody does something to hurt you, right? It, it may be worse than that. Don't engage. Don't get aggressive. Just get the basics. I need your name. I need your insurance, insurance information. Sometimes there's just no doubt. You, you know if something's broken, you, you know if something's really bad. It's the ones that you just can't really tell. And so I, I tell folks ahead of time, look, you don't know how you are. You, you can't tell in that moment. You're certainly rattled. You're feeling something. Yeah, I'm, I'm hurt. Um, you may not need an ambulance. Maybe you do. A lot of people don't want to take an ambulance because they don't want to leave their bike. 
Um, and so, you know, that's certainly understandable. I've had um, ambulance drivers kind enough to take people's bikes with them to the hospital. But um, yeah, you know, the minute you start saying I'm not hurt, just know that that's going to be used against you. You know, it's the same thing when you're talking about um, social media. I mean, a lot of us like to share our experiences with our friends, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Um, you know, and sometimes we're even Snapchatting our rides. Um, but the minute you start saying, you know, I'm fine, just assume that three months from now, some insurance company is going to be looking at that saying that, hey, you said you were fine right after this happened. Why should I believe that when you went to the doctor two days later, you were hurt because of anything that happened in this, as opposed to just, you know, you're somebody who's out to get money. So everything you say can be used against <laughs> you. And, you know, yeah, we want the will. police out there because they have the authority to talk to the driver, look at their record, find out what their insurance information is, generate a report. If they don't show up, you're just exchanging. And there right. are incidents where that's going to be appropriate, but not always. We want the police to come out. We want the record to be made so it gets into the public work so we can see what these collision rates are. Yeah, And, and even beyond that, sometimes um, your only recovery is against your own insurance policy. And many of those insurance policies have a requirement in them that they will only cover you if there's a police report that's been generated. So um, it really, it's a rare exception when it, it makes sense not to call the police. As a general rule, you want the police there and you want to gather the information and you want to help them get it right. Right, and you want them to be on your side or at least do justice. Yeah. So we've gotten out of the road. We've called the police. We've gotten information about the, the witnesses, taken pictures where we can. Look for some support. Now, the next thing is, let's say you were hurt. The police showed up. You got everything recorded. You were in a collision. What's the next step? Well, you really want to follow up quickly with medical attention. And so whether that's going to the emergency room right then and there or urgent care or depending what time of day it is, you know, doing it first thing the next day, you want to get checked out right away. And Why? checked out by, well, because um, number one, you're going through some things that you may not be fully aware of. And, and having a doctor look at that to make sure that there's not some internal bleeding you may not be aware of. You know, many people sustain head injuries and the, at the scene of the crash, they're fine. Uh, and then hours later, suddenly it becomes an emergency situation because there was a slow bleed inside their brain that didn't seem to bother them at first. We've both had the case where we're contacted by an injured cyclist that said, I didn't think I was hurt, didn't call the police, as I was riding home, the adrenaline wore mm -hmm. off, and I realized my knee doesn't feel right. Yeah. You know, this is a cyclist who needs his knees. Right. And he's got no police report, and he doesn't know the driver's contact mm -hmm. anymore. His $10,000 bike is crashed yeah. out. That guy is out of luck, basically. I mean, you, you've taken a situation where there's an opportunity for you to be made whole, put back in the position you were before this crash, and you've prevented us as lawyers from being able to achieve that for you. So, so as far as the medical care is concerned, the other thing too is that, you know, look, it's in our DNA as cyclists to endure pain and, and to suffer a little bit. And, and we understand that that's part of our sport, it's part of our recreation, it's part of what we do. But when you try to just stoically plow through pain, right, or injury, separate from just soreness or, you know, your legs telling you that they're tired, you're trying to just deal with this on your own. And so, you know, you say, I'm just, I'm not gonna go to the doctor. And then two weeks later, you realize that, you know, gosh, this, this back pain, this hip pain just hasn't gone mm -hmm. away. And now you get checked out two weeks later. You know, we're going to hear when we try to help you with this. Hey, dude didn't go to the doctor for two weeks. He's not hurt. He only went to the doctor because he was out for money. Absolutely. You know, and, and so you're not helping yourself physically. You're really handicapping um, the chances that we have to get you back into the position you should have been in when you don't follow up promptly with medical care. A lot of times people are worried, especially folks who don't have health insurance, they're worried that, you know, I don't want to go to the doctor because I, I can't, I can't come out of pocket and I can't afford it. Or even if they have health insurance, but they have an enormous deductible and, and they don't want to be responsible for that because they just can't afford to do it. If you're in a crash like the ones we're describing where somebody's negligent and did that, you don't have to be concerned about, will my health insurance pay this? Because we're gonna get your medical bills covered one way or the other through the course of this case. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have access to a doctor, then you need to call a lawyer who can help you to say, hey, yeah, there are doctors all over this town who are happy to see you and treat you, and they'll get paid when you're able to pay them, whether it's out of a recovery in the case, 
or however it's handled. So you shouldn't let the fact that you're either uninsured or you just can't afford that doctor visit keep you from going. So I come at this from a point of view, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody who's watching this, but I come at this from the point of view that the insurance industry as a whole is completely corrupt. And that when it comes to claims investigation and claims management and claims payment, they're not out to treat you fairly. They're not out to put you in a position where you're made whole for your losses. They're out to screw you in any way they possibly can. And it starts with that initial contact. And so, Yes, you have a duty to cooperate with your own insurance company. Certainly, if your own insurance company wants a statement from you, then you're going to have to give them some sort of a statement. But just be mindful that they're not doing this so that they can lay the foundation for paying you later and paying you what you're entitled to. They're doing it in a way that, hey, how can we position this in a way that maybe we can avoid covering this at all or minimize what we have to pay out? Certainly, when it comes to talking to the other person's insurance company, the negligent driver, you really are in danger with the things you say to that. And, you know, I, I look, people come to me at all stages of their case, and sometimes they've given statements, sometimes they haven't. But uh, if it were up to me, I would tell people don't ever give a recorded statement to the other driver's insurance company unless you have your lawyer on the line with you to do it, just to make sure that the questions are fair, that you're not being manipulated into saying something that you don't really mean, but something that the insurance company will hold against you to minimize what they have to pay you in the course of handling this claim completely unfairly, right? Not because of anything, any genuine interest in let's get to the truth and let's get to trying to collaboratively figure out the true value of your injury claim, but in a way that how can we position you so that you will never be able to get fair treatment out of us, the insurance company. I tell people, look, if you have to talk to the insurance company, talk about your bike and getting your bike looked at and your bike either fixed or getting a fair amount of money for what your bike is worth. Um, but if they want to talk about your injuries, you can just let them know, look, I'm hurt, I have a lawyer, and you can talk to my lawyer about my injuries. And if they don't have a lawyer or they haven't decided yet, what's... Even what? if they haven't decided, I'm hurt, I'm going to get a lawyer, I'm going to talk to a lawyer, and then you could either talk to them or I'll talk to you. But at, at least this, this way in my home state, the, the property damage claim is separate from the injury claim. So you can resolve the issue, and that, that tends to be a lot of folks' first concern is, what about my bike? Um, you can resolve that issue with the insurance company separate from anything to do with your injury. A lot of insurance companies, and really the ones that I consider the most corrupt, um, they will try to get somebody to sign away their injury claim by offering them money, or at least what appears to be money, right away. And if you don't realize the nature and extent of your injuries because it just happened, mm -hmm. um, I've had plenty of folks come to me with pieces of paper said, yeah, hey, I signed this release with the insurance company, but I'm hurt, so what can you do to help me? And I said, well, I could have done a lot to help you before you put your ink on that piece of paper, but once you sign the release, you know, that word release means I'm giving up my claim. So, mm -hmm. so you know, I tell people, look, whatever you do, don't sign anything. Um, you can get your bike fixed, you can get your bike uh, paid off if it's a total loss. Um, you know, take it to a good bike shop. Certainly, if you have a bike shop that you like and that you know and they know you, take it there. Um, but don't engage the insurance company about your injuries until you know that the diagnosis is done, your treatment is done, you understand what the recovery has been. You know, and certainly um, for folks who are older who are riding, um, you know, we just don't bounce back the way we used to, right? And so stuff that maybe in your 20s, you take a tumble, you get, you know, you run into a brick wall and a day later you're fine, you know, it may not work that way with your body when you're in your 40s, 50s, and 60s. So respect that and, and give yourself time before you go and um, think that, okay, I'm just going to um, resolve this claim with the insurance company. Yeah, I, I don't know any personal injury lawyer who charges somebody for an initial consultation. I mean, that initial consultation to just talk about what happened to you, get some advice on how, should, how I should proceed, and then Multiple. figure out... They could go to a couple people, sure. get a consult, you, you, you find could, out what this lawyer says, hang up, call a different lawyer up, see what they say. You're interviewing the lawyer. The right. lawyer's not... They may interview you, but really... You're the hiring party, right? And that's something and, they should And certainly, remember. I think you want to find somebody credible. And and you know, I I don't look. We all get bombarded. If you turn on the television any time of day or night, you're bombarded with commercials. If you ride your bike or drive anywhere, you see billboards. You know, attorneys advertise like crazy. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're the right ones. Doesn't necessarily mean they're the wrong ones. But you should do your due diligence, as you're saying, and talk to different folks and find somebody that you're comfortable with. And and yeah, there's no charge for that. 
Um, certainly in the area of bike crashes, you know, there are lawyers who deal with this sort of thing on a regular basis. And then there are other kind of general personal injury practitioners who just think that, eh, bike crash is no different than anything else. Um, you and I certainly uh, understand the subtleties of what goes on with the mechanics of a bike wreck, um, the issues that are different as it relates to somebody riding a bike versus somebody in a car, that we know they're uniquely different kinds of cases. Um, but, you know, you, you, I'm sure most lawyers feel that they could handle that sort of thing for you.